Go where your best prayers take you and clench the fists of your spirit and take it easy. Breathe deeply of the glad air and live one day at a time. Know that you are precious and learn to trust. Amen. Well, good morning to everyone. I hope you're enjoying this pretty morning and this great weather we're having. It's a great time of year, and I hope you're not too busy during May. I know it is super busy. We are doing graduations and retirements and all kind of things, so hang in there. We'll be to summer here in just a couple of weeks, I know. I was out of town early in the week when I got back. Um, the strangest thing, I was at the house, and I kept thinking, why do I hear this buzzing? I went outside, and it wasn't buzzing. There were lots of little airplanes flying around, more than normal. And I thought, this is so strange. What's that about? Well, yesterday morning, I turned on the news um, early before I went to do my day, what I was going to do, work out and stuff, and turned on WVLT, and there was our own Paige Noel, cute as she always is, our weather girl. She, I don't know if she's here this morning. Give her a shout out. She did a great job with the weather. And then my question was answered because the next little piece on the news was about what was going on. It's an aviation fly-in from the Tuskegee Next Foundation right here in Knoxville. And you may have seen the planes. There are a bunch of them flying all the time. I guess yesterday was yesterday the last day. What they do is simple. They have volunteer pilots that bring their planes and they offer their time and they take at-risk teenagers, boys and girls, flying. It's that simple. And not just any teenagers, but specifically black and minority teenagers. See, the foundation sees itself honoring, honoring deeply the Tuskegee Airmen. You know who they were. They were our first African-American pilots and mechanics and bombardiers and navigators and served courageously over Europe flying fighters and bombers. And they were our first in the armed forces. They were trained at the Tuskegee Institute, now the University of Alabama, and they were flying planes in Europe at risk while America was still locked up in the South by Jim Crow laws and across America by segregation. The mission of the foundation is to show, is a really simple idea that you'll just grab, and I got it. They're trying to show these at-risk teens what is possible. You can learn to fly. You can have a career in aviation, and there are a lot of jobs, and they talk them through all of that. And the little gig is the fun of going up for a plane ride. And it's working. It's very successful. But as you can imagine, it is also helping the kids look just beyond that airplane and higher into the sky, into themselves, to stay in school, to make good grades, develop character, to find the discipline to achieve a better life. What a payoff. And see, at the heart of it is such a simple idea these pilots are sharing something that's joyful to them. We have a pilot sitting right here that's joyful, that they love to do. It's flying. They love it, and they want to share it. And I say after I listened to that and thought about it, I thought it was a challenge to me. It really was. I thought, when and how often have I taken the opportunity to share what I love to do with someone, particularly a young person, so that maybe that influence would help steer a little direction, change a little course, make their life better. You know, we all hold up our hands these days, maybe in prayer. <laughs> we wring our hands, we shake our fist in the air and complain about how bad the world is. And it is constant. And I join you in that. We want to make the world a better place. I think it comes from a good motive good motivation. But, you know, we can do what we can do. We can give something that we love to another person. It is doable. Or let me say it more succinctly. Take your love and give it away. Take your love and give it away. Last week, Chris, in a lovely sermon about the Good Shepherd, reminded us that God's love is in the world. That's a given. And very eloquently, he 
pounded upon the point. God's love is part of the universe. It's part of, it's part of life. It is part of us, period. It is in us. Maybe it is cellular. Who knows? And so today, which is, by the way, our last day that we will celebrate Easter. We'll move on next week. The ball is in our court. Because, see, the gospel is Jesus' teaching. You know these words. How many times have you heard them? As I have loved you, you should love one another. As I have loved you, you should love one another. You are my, my disciples if you live, love one another. This is one of the teachings the disciples will hear from Jesus before they see him no longer. Next week we're going to celebrate that, the ascension. And Jesus in these appearances will no longer appear. And so he leaves this teaching with them. See, just as the plain truth that God's love is in the world, likewise, it is the plain truth that Jesus believed that love, L-O-V-E, if I need to spell it, is the Alpha and Omega. It's the deal. It's the beginning and the end, and actually everything in between. By the way, do you remember Jesus' first teaching? You know what it was? He was in his hometown, little tiny place. He was at the little local synagogue, and he went in and picked up the book for daily prayer. And they have a lay reader, so he took over the lay reader's job. And he began to read and to preach and to teach. And you know the words. I have come to free the prisoner, to give sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, to set free all who are bound in any captivity. And today is the last teaching. If you are to be my disciples, you must love. I don't know about you, but I constantly get caught up in my head. It just rises up in me, this stirring, these conflictual arguments, debates about issues of morality, what is proper, what is practical, what is workable, what is provable. And yet Jesus, 2,000 years ago, taught something so simple, that love is the spiritual answer. It is the goal. It is the prize. And <laughs> is there any other way to say it? It's the point, folks. And I'm trying to take the point well. It's the point of everything. When all else fails, Everything fails in your human toolkit because it will. Try love. If you are stuck, try some love. Love is always possible. Anywhere, everywhere, anytime, in any situation. Whether we believe that or not, it's the truth. If you are stuck, try a little love. Some of you know that one of my favorite sayings, and you have to hear them too often, is Abraham Lincoln. He said, you don't grow a carrot by pulling on it. I pulled on lots of carrots. No, the way we help someone grow or change is to love them, is to love them through the change. And I want to tell you something. If you think this is kind of some limpy, wimpy thing, it is not. That's the hardest thing in the world to do, to stand by someone in love as they change. Most of us have not the patience or anything else. I sure didn't lots of times. But love does change things. It changes us. It influences change in some subtle, powerful way that we are not even sure how it works. But you know what? It does work. You know, if love is a hard word for you, and I think it's hard for all of us in our language, why don't you substitute something else from Scripture so that you can wrap your head around this? Substitute something else. I'll start the list. How about care, compassion, kindness, tolerance, forgiveness, understanding, patience, forbearance, mercy, justice. Well, the thing that I hope you come here for and I long for all the time is peace.
honest to goodness, just some peace in my soul. So I want you to go with me before I quit talking, which will be shortly, to Mother's Day in Little Rock, Arkansas. Well, it's actually the day before Mother's Day. And I want you to visit Melvin and Doris Amright, a real couple. He's in his 90s. She is right at 90. They've been married 60 years. And Doris will tell you that Melvin is the same husband and good father that he's always been. She still loves him as much as she did 60 years ago. And they have quite a story that I don't know much about, but it's captured in a simple picture, one among all their children and grandchildren. It's a picture of them, and he was in the Air Force in World War II, and he married a Japanese woman. You think they don't know a thing or two? Well, Doris is putting on her shoes because they're about to take their morning walk. That's how we meet her. So she's lacing up her shoes, and Melvin loves to walk, but see, Doris has to walk with him. Can you guess why? Because he has dementia. Gentle, but progressing. And if she doesn't walk with him, he might not make it home, actually. So every day, they take a great walk, and sometimes in the evening, they take another walk. But as Doris puts, laces up her shoes and puts on her shoes, she realizes when she gets out the door that Melvin has already left for the walk. So trying to close down the panic, she kind of runs up the street and kind of looks, and she sees a couple of neighbors. You see Melvin? They went that way. And she goes up, and then she realizes she can't see him. And she says, oh. So she walks back to the house and thinks about it. And then she realizes what she must do, so she calls the police. And she explains the situation and simply says, you know, not panicking, not blue lights, but could I get some help? And I promise you, the Little Rock police called out about three or four cars and went immediately to their neighborhood. Well, it took about 20 minutes, but Sergeant Brian Grigsby and Officer Tony Dillard pull up and find Melvin walking, fortunately, fine, but on a really dangerous, busy street. And they pull over and gently just get out and walk toward him and say, hey, and you're Melvin, yes. And they introduce themselves and said, you know, your wife, Doris, you know, knew you were probably tired and wanted us to give you a ride home. So come on. So he does, gets in the car. When the doors close before they start the engine, he says, by the way, I am not lost. And they go, they turn around and do one of these. He says, I am not lost. I know, now, I don't know how to get home but I know where I was going. And they said, where were you going? He said, well, today is the day before Mother's Day. And for 55 years, when I could drive, I bought Doris flowers. And I intend to do that today. So I'm walking to get some flowers. The policeman said, you're a man on a mission. <laughs> well, they called dispatch and said, Hey, we're going to take the gentleman home. We'll be back in duty here in a few minutes. What they didn't tell secretly, but got exposed, is they drove him to a Super Kroger <laughs> that has a florist shop. So they take in, they go in with him to buy flowers, help him pick them out. And of course, he has to get two dozen roses because that's what he always does. And the great thing is the video camera catches when Melvin is paying, he's a little short on cash, and you just see the sly Sergeant Grigsby hand go around with the little money and hand it behind his back to the cashier. So back in the car, on their way home, and Doris is waiting, of course, at the doorstep and walks out, and she sees, and she's relieved, and she wasn't too worried, but a bit, but then she sees the flowers, and she starts crying. Because you see, she understands why he walked away, what he was doing. Doris thanks the officers. They say, you're welcome. And then she says a very poignant thing to them. She leans over and says, you know, there's so much, there's so much that Melvin's mind can't remember, but his heart remembers. That story is your lesson this morning. Every one of you, and it should be mine. Maybe we can see ourselves as people on a mission. Maybe we should see ourselves 
as people on the mission. You see, Jesus said, love is the answer. And if you'd like to debate or chat with me, I want you to come see me. Love is the mission of the church. Our care for others is what matters. It matters more than anything. I think that's what Jesus is trying to say. By the way, do you notice that the police officers got caught up in Melvin's mission? Isn't that interesting? Isn't it funny how love works that way? It moves and spreads naturally by creating something good and lovely in its path. You don't have to pull or push. You don't have to pull or push. You know, in a world that moves ever so fast and so amazingly impersonally ever more, ever more impersonal, where the issues of right and wrong tear and pull at us, create suspicion and animosity between us, sometimes in your own family, where put-downs and blaming and uncivil discourse abound at every turn and are on the front page in the headline news every night. Our mission is evident. Our mission is love. The world needs an antidote. It always has, by the way. We're no different than any other time in history. It might need this one pretty soon, though. So maybe let love bear our guide. Just do it easily, naturally. A guide that helps us maybe take a look at what we are doing not another person. Look at yourself. What am I doing? What are ways that I'm acting? What are things that I'm saying or not saying? And then maybe ask the challenging but good question, the spiritual question that Jesus asked us today. Is it loving? Is it loving? After all, Doris Amright is correct. You know what our minds forget? Our hearts always remember. Amen.